46. It's Romans 6, 1 through 11. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the sinful body might be destroyed, and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. For we know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. new members join the church. It's usually a time we have new members. Uh, confirmation class. Uh, a lot of times uh, pastors will try to schedule a baptism, right? We did that and baptism. it's a time in the Methodist church that we sometimes renew our baptismal vows. And it's a very important time. Pentecost was a, a mountaintop experience, if you will, in the Bible and certainly in the early church, the beginning of the church. That was the start of the church. And um, so we do all of those kinds of things. And like I said, it was a mountaintop experience. And one of the things that happens after we have a mountaintop experience is uh, we got to come <coughs> off the mountain. And a lot of times that happens all too soon. So weeks have passed. And has that flame of Pentecost maybe dimmed a little. And it's something for us to think about, especially in light of the scripture that is given for us this morning. Have we forgotten that Jesus has overcome death? And that as Christians, we will suffer a physical death. But we have been promised through grace, eternity, with him in heaven. And so often I think we as Christians forget that. We let that kind of go to the back of our minds and we just continue with our daily lives. Do we, you know that being baptized with him is assured us a place with him in heaven for eternity? That is really something for us to think about. You know, I, in my Christian life, I keep, this is, they tell you that you can't wrap your head around eternity. You can't wrap your head around infinity. Uh, a lot of times we can't wrap our heads around what's in the headlights. Uh, so that kind of thing is really tough for us to grasp. And I don't know why, but every time I see a butterfly, it, it reminds me of the Christian life. And by that I mean, if, if you look at your life here on earth and this body as a caterpillar, 
when you look at the tomb as that as that thing that hangs from a tree <laughs> somewhere when the caterpillar wraps itself up and then suddenly a week later or whenever it happens out comes something that looks completely different and kind of wonderful right from an ugly old caterpillar and you get <laughs> some of the most spectacular butterflies you've ever seen and that's just one way I try to relate what what that's like the theme in the lectionary is kind of interesting and I think okay, you put it in the bulletin there and it's called uh, from crisis to community certainly in the early church they were in crisis their leader was gone now Christ had been crucified they all knew that he had been resurrected many people and it's all documented saw him once he came from the from the tomb and he spent that time between the resurrection and the ascension seeing hundreds of people but once he ascended then what do you do the boss is gone how do we carry on how do we take his message that he was so good at and these apostles these 12 that became 11 and they had to elect a new one how do they manage to spread this gospel message throughout the known world and Christianity get to the point where it is today? That is just as difficult for us to get our heads around. What happened? Pentecost. The coming which Jesus promised us about the Holy Spirit. The one that was going to come and dwell in the heart of every believer. Now, whenever I'm asked to preach, I always look for some kind of affirmation from God. And when I'm, when I'm preparing, I want to make sure that what I say to you today is what God wants his people to hear, not what Lee came up with. And I rarely stray from using his word. But today I'm going to do something a little different because uh, my pastor, Wendy, told me that you, that you guys needed somebody to stand in for Pastor Kathy. And as soon as she told me that, I started looking at the lectionary and figuring out, well, what is it I'm going to say? And lo and behold, a friend of mine sent me something which I think was God sent. And uh, when I retired, a friend of mine, <laughs> a friend of mine talked me into becoming an umpire. Mm -hmm. And I ended up umpiring for four years with Little League. And uh, it was just a great experience. It really was. <laughs> you know, I had played baseball all my life. Uh, but when you become an umpire, you find out that there's a game within the game, which is amongst the umpires. I mean, uh, the, the way that they move, the, the things that they have to cover. I mean, it was a whole different ball game. And anyway, I got this, I got this article in the mail, and, and I want to share, share it with you today as part of the message. And it's called Stay at 17 Inches. In Nashville, Tennessee, during the first week of January 1996, more than 4,000 baseball coaches descended upon the Opryland Hotel for the 52nd Annual Baseball Coaches Association Convention. While I waited in line to register with the hotel staff, I heard other more veteran coaches rumbling about the lineup of speakers scheduled to present during the weekend. One name in particular kept resurfacing, always with the same sentiment. John Scalinos is here. Oh man, worth every penny of the airfare. I found the clinic schedule in my bag, 1 p.m., John Scalinos, Cal Poly Pomona. It was the man whose name I had heard buzzing around the lobby two days earlier. Could he be the reason that all 4,000 coaches had returned early to the convention hall? Wow, I thought, this guy must really be good. I had no idea. In 1996, Coach Scalinos was 78 years old. Five years retired from a college coaching career that began in 1948. He shuffled to the stage in an impressive standing ovation, wearing dark polyester pants, a light blue shirt, and a string around his neck from which home hung home plate. A full-size, stark white home plate. Seriously, I wondered, who is this guy? After speaking for 25 minutes, not once mentioning the prop hanging around his neck, Coach Scalinas appeared to notice the snickering among some of the coaches. Even those who knew Coach Scalinas had to wonder exactly where he was going with this 
or if he had simply forgotten about home plate since he'd gotten on stage. Then finally, you're probably all wondering why I'm wearing home plate around my neck. Or maybe you think I escaped from the Camarillo State Hospital. <laughs> he, he said, his voice growing irascible. I laughed along with the others, acknowledging the possibility. No, he continued, I may be old, but I'm not crazy. The reason I stand before you today is to share with you baseball people what I've learned in my life, what I've learned about home plate in my 78 years. Several hands went up when Scalinos asked how many Little League coaches were in the room. Do you know how wide home plate is in Little League, he said. After a pause, someone offered uh, 17 inches, more of a question than an answer. Another long pause. That's right, how about in Babe Ruth? Any Babe Ruth coaches in the room? That's right, said Scalinas. Now how many high school coaches do we have in the room? Hundreds of hands shot up as the pattern began to appear. How wide is home plate in, uh, in Babe Ruth? 17 inches, came a resounding answer. You're right, and you college coaches, how wide is home plate in college? 17 inches, we said in unison. Any minor league coaches here? How wide is home plate in pro ball? 17 inches. Right. And in major leagues, how wide is home plate in the major leagues? 17 inches. 17 inches, he confirmed. His voice bellowing off the walls. And what do you do in big league to a big league pitcher who can't throw the ball over 17 inches? They send them to Pocatello. He hollered, drawing raucous laughter. Pocatello is a minor league place, he said, <laughs> pros. What they don't do is this. They don't say, oh, that's okay, Jimmy. You can't hit 17-inch target. We'll make it 18 inches, or maybe 19. And if that's not wide enough, maybe we'll go to 20, maybe 25. There was a long pause. Coaches, what do you do when your best player shows up late to practice? When our team rules forbid facial hair and a guy shows up unshaven, what if he gets caught drinking? Do you hold him accountable? Or do you change the rules to fit him? Do we widen the home plate? Chuckles gradually faded as 4,000 coaches grew quiet. The fog lifting as the old coach's message began to unfold. He turned the plate toward himself and using a Sharpie, he began to draw something. And when he turned it toward the crowd, point up, a house was revealed complete with a freshly drawn door and two windows. This is the problem in our homes today, with our marriages, with the way we parent our kids, with our discipline. We don't teach accountability to our kids, and there is no consequence for failing to meet standards. We widen the plate. Then to the point at the top of the plate, of the house, he added a small American flag. And this is the problem in our schools today. The quality of our education is going downhill fast and teachers have been stripped of the tools they need to be successful and to educate and discipline our young people. We are allowing others to widen their own plate. Where is that getting us? Silence. He replaced the flag with a cross. And this is the problem in the church, where, power, where powerful people in positions of authority have taken advantage of young children only to have such an atrocity swept under the rug for years. Our church leaders are widening the plate. Now I pause from reading the article here to ask you some questions. And I hope you find this article as thought-provoking as I did. Whether you're a baseball fan or not, I think you can get the drift. Rules are rules. In games, in business, in families, and in life. Where are our rules written for Christians? Paul was reminding us in our scripture today that we are given a new life in Christ. A promise of overcoming death. Death is not the end. It is the marking of a new beginning for eternity. And through the grace of God, we are made new. We're to turn from sin, and we are to follow the rules. The rules written for us by God in his word. Right here. 
human being's owner's manual, that's what <laughs> I like to refer to it as. Anything you need to know, it's been put here for us. It's not out of date, never goes out of date. Why have rules? Let's look at verses 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are, we are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? How many times have you been told that when you were saved, you were made new? You're a new person in Christ. Believe it or not, though, this was an actual argument in the old church, in the, in the beginning of the church. People said, well, this is great. We can pretty much do anything we want because grace covers it all. No matter what. Paul was saying, Paul was saying, no, you're, you got this all wrong. One of my favorite references is an old pastor, an old Texas pastor, uh, J. Vernon McGee. I don't know if any of you are familiar with him. McGee died in 1988. But his five-year through the Bible series is still broadcast on radio and around the world today. And he's quite an interesting character to listen to. But this is what he says about this, uh, this particular passage. He says, we are never dead to sin as long as we are in this life. The literal translation is, how shall we who have died to sin? Note this distinction. That means we died in the person of our substitute, Jesus Christ. We died to sin in Christ, but we are never dead to sin. Any honest person knows he never reaches the place where he is dead to sin. He does reach the place where he wants to live for God, but he recognizes he still has the old sin nature. You know, one of my favorite things, and I talk about it many times when I'm speaking to folks, is I love the old cartoons. And, uh, you know, whether it's Tweety and Sylvester uh, or the Roadrunner or whatever, but how many times with, with, the, with Tweety and Sylvester... Uh, you know, Sylvester would be going after Tweety, and what would happen? Uh, a, a, a moral decision had to be made. And Pop, on one shoulder, would be the devil, <laughs> and on the other shoulder, it would be an angel, right? Yeah. And they would argue with each other in, in Sylvester's ear. And as Christians, don't we have that happen all the time with every decision that we have to make? We know what we would like to do but as Christians the Holy Spirit is usually right there on the other shoulder saying mm, I don't really think you want to do that <laughs> I don't think you ought to do that we know and I believe Christian or not people know what is right in their own hearts now, Jesus, who was sinless, carried my sins and your sins to the cross. That's what we believe, isn't it, as, as Christians? And by accepting him as our Lord and Savior, our sins died with him, and we have the promise of rising with him. Now, our scripture goes on to say, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Jesus, Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Now that's an interesting verse because he talks about baptism, but you'll notice there's no water in that verse. Water isn't mentioned anywhere. What it says is we were baptized into the death of Jesus. Our water baptism is an outward sign of our faith. The real baptism with Christ occurred at the cross. Our sins, yours, mine, put him there. And that is why he was sent. That's why God sent his son to die for us, to carry our sins to the cross. McGee goes on to say, just as we are identified with Christ in his death, likewise we are identified with Christ in his resurrection. We are joined today to a living Christ. In other words, our sins have already been judged. We are already raised. 
We are yonder seated with Christ in the heavenlies. And my friend, there are only two places for your sins. Either they are on Christ when he died for you over 2,000 years ago, or they're still on you. And you're waiting for judgment. There's no third place for sins to go. Our scripture goes on and says, For if we have been united with him in death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him, for we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. And the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now, I didn't know this ahead of time, but <laughs> I always say, you know, I look for affirmations places. What did, what did Michelle put on the cover of your bullet? Picked it out of all of that scripture. Dead sin, alive to God. Amen? Amen. What a great ending for our scripture today. How do we become alive to God? It's what we're charged to do, to become alive to God. Daily prayers, <clears throat> daily time in His Word, <coughs> following the rules. Pay attention to the rules. God's rules and man's rules. And where they contradict, what do we as Christians do? I think your smart money is on God's rules. And those rules are here. And those are the rules I believe that all of us in our hearts know are the right and the wrong rules. We have terrible conflict going on in our society today. It starts in the families, spreads to our communities, spreads to our countries, to our nations. The whole world is on fire today. And we are seeing things today that probably 50 years ago we find incomprehensible. <laughs> you know, I really thought that the older I got, easier things would get. You know, we'd all get smarter, we'd all do some things that, you know, that we had learned along the way. And, uh, you know, more and more I'm finding that one of the biggest things that man has a problem with is assuming. Assuming that everybody knows what you know. Assuming that people think the way that you do. Assuming that, well, everything's going to be all right. Because without getting involved, we can't guarantee anything. And I, I'm afraid that the... Christian church is starting to not be held accountable. People are starting to think too much like the secular world that they're growing up in. So government makes rules, and instead of the church fighting against those rules, they go along with those rules. You know, can we all just get along? Peace, love, dove. God loves everybody. That's not the Bible. That's not the God that's in this Bible. Let me conclude and read the rest of the article. I was amazed at a baseball convention where I expected to learn something about curveballs and bunting and how to run better practices. I had learned something far more valuable. From an old man with home plate hung around his neck, I had learned something about life, about myself, about my own weaknesses, and about my responsibilities 
as a leader. I had to hold myself and others accountable to that which I knew to be right, lest our families, our faith, and our society continue down an undesirable path. If I'm lucky, Coach Scalene has concluded, you will remember one thing from this old coach today. It is this. If we fail to hold ourselves to a higher standard, a standard of what we know to be right, if we fail to hold our spouses and our children to the same standards, if we are unwilling or unable to provide a consequence when they do not meet the standard, and if our schools and churches and our government fail to hold themselves accountable to those they serve, there is but one thing to look forward to. With that, he held home plate in front of his chest, turned it around, and revealed its dark black side. Dark days ahead, he said. Coach Scalinos died in 2009 at the age of 91, but not before touching the lives of hundreds of players and coaches, including mine. Meeting him at my first conference convention kept me returning year after year looking for similar wisdom and inspiration from other coaches. He is the best clinic speaker that the conference has ever known because he was so much more than a baseball coach. His message was clear. Coaches, keep your players, no matter how good they are, your own children, and most of all, keep yourselves at 17 inches. He was indeed worth the airfare. <laughs> Amen. Amen.